The, the brutal fact is one in every two people are going to get cancer. I met an oncologist who told me I had stage four metastatic melanoma and it was life limiting and incurable. Then there was a wrinkle. There was a larger wrecking ball, is perhaps <laughs> how I would describe it, that came swinging through everybody's life. Yeah, which is COVID. And the next day I had, and I'm getting quite emotional about this, I had an email from Alistair which suddenly the light in the room just exploded. So Kevin, how are we? I'm very well, thanks Danny. Very well, how are you? Good, good, and it's good to see you again. It's been a while. So we'll jump straight into it today. Um, yeah. We've got a lot to cover and I want to make sure we do the story justice. Um, so you very graciously agreed to talk about your own journey with stage four cancer mm -hmm. and that's ultimately motivated you, inspired you, wh whatever it was, to write your first book, hopefully the first of many, yeah. um, called Stories of Cancer and Hope. So before we get on to your story, it might be worth just quickly touching what's the book about? It's just copies here in front. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, the book has 39 personal stories of cancer and hope, including my own. Uh -huh. And it took about a year and a half to pull it together, um, chatting to people I knew who'd been affected by cancer and some people I was introduced to that I hadn't met before and to some extent stalking people on social media <laughs> that were quite happy to talk about um, cancer. Mm -hmm. And in chatting to these people, I wanted to try and pull together uh, something physical, um, which people affected by cancer, and that's, you know, I'm, I'm personally affected by cancer, but my wife's affected, my children, my family, my friends, they're affected by my cancer. And the whole aim of the book was to try and give this to people um, so they wouldn't feel alone because cancer is a very scary place, especially mm -hmm. when you're first diagnosed. Yeah. Um, I don't think you can underestimate the importance of having resources like that available. Resources that are actually coming from people who've worked the, the journey before. Um, yeah. the, the brutal fact is one in every two people are going to get cancer. Um, so having resources like this that help people live with cancer. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the, 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 the friends and, it's not just the individual, it's the friends and family um, that, that go along as well. I've um, read on most of the stories um, within it. Um, and one of the, the things that, well, a few things that I've, I've taken away from the book, um, it was amazing to read how personal each of the stories are, mm. um, first and foremost. So the hats off to the, the folk who, who, who agreed to do it. Um, there's a lot of um, vulnerability within each of the stories. But the main thing is that, unfortunately, cancer is a well-trodden path. But with that well-trodden path, there also comes strength. All the people who have been there before you have left something either uh, with, within the research that goes on to help treat cancer or the strength of the support groups that, yeah. that, that need to go through. So um, that was one of the things I took away. The other one was you absolutely shouldn't face cancer alone um, and there's no need to face face it alone. Yeah. Um, the support of the, the communities that people have, both in terms of their own community, in terms of friends, families, extended work ones, but mm -hmm. also the, the support communities around it. Um, that really came through in it. And, and the last bit that came through, which I think is probably the main reason for the book, is there can always be hope. Yes. That hope is constant. That's something that uh, a friend of ours who's an oncology nurse mm -hmm. um, told me. And it's it's one of the central quotes that I use on social media uh -huh. and with, within the book. And, and hope changes as well. Um, obviously, this book is specifically about um, uh, people's journeys with cancer or experiences with cancer. People will face um, a number of challenges and traumas within their life. And hope can change um, throughout that journey, mm -hmm. um, specifically in the world of cancer, I, I say it in the introduction, um, you might think there's something physically wrong. You hope it's not cancer. You're told it's cancer. You hope it's curable. You hope it's treatable. Um, and for those people that are told, unfortunately, that perhaps the cancer is terminal, hope changes. And you start hoping that your family are going to be okay mm -hmm. um, without you. You hope you might, you might have a, a pain-free um, end of life. So hope constantly changes throughout this. Some One person's desperate circumstance can be another person's hopeful outcome. It's amazing to think that, isn't it? It, it, it really mm -hmm. can be. And yes, yeah. I, I felt incredibly privileged, Danny, um, that people wanted to share their story with me. And for some of them, they were telling me things which they'd never shared mm -hmm. um, with their family or their friends before. 
And I felt incredibly privileged because they trusted me with her story and perhaps because I'd had a similar lived experience and I could relate to the emotions that they had gone through and are still currently going through. I, I felt very humbled that they wanted to share their stories. Absolutely. So on to your own experience. So life was going swimmingly. It was. Yeah. Then what happened? What happened was the, the back story for myself is in 2018, I had a cyst on my forearm, which I thought was nothing, but I was convinced to go along and see the doctor who... Small, relatively? It, yeah, it was probably about the size of uh, you know, a 5p coin. Mm -hmm. um, it looked rather unusual. The doctor had a good look at it and said, it doesn't look cancerous. We'll give you some cream, but if it changes, come back. And so it started to change color and, and shape and size. And I went back and I got referred to a dermatologist. And they did a biopsy and discovered that it was cancerous. And I was then quickly taken into hospital to have the cyst removed. It was classed as stage two cancer. Uh, it was quite deep for, uh, for the, the type of uh, melanoma that it was. It was classified as melanoma cancer. And I had a lymph node removed from under my arm because cancer tends to spread to lymph nodes. And I remember getting a call in May of 2018. I'd uh, been out for a nice lunch with a friend of mine. And I got a call from the hospital saying, congratulations, uh, your cancer hasn't spread. And at that point, I just uh, fell to my knees in the middle of Princess Street in Edinburgh <laughs> and started crying because the relief was immense to be told that they'd managed to get the cancer. So life carried on for another 18 months until I felt a pain in my back. And I ended up going into A&E because the pain was so acute. They took an x-ray and then they contacted me and said they needed to do a CT scan. And following the CT scan, on Friday the 13th of December 2019, I'm not superstitious, but <laughs> it just happened to be the date, I met an oncologist who told me I had stage 4 metastatic melanoma, a tumour in my lung and a tumour next to my spine, and it was life-limiting and incurable. Well, and I know from a previous chat with you, you went to that meeting on your, by yourself, didn't you? And you, you, you list that as one of the biggest mistakes or regrets that you made within that process. Absolutely. Um, looking back and reflecting on that, perhaps I was naive. The oncologist wanted to chat about maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Did you it's, not think, clearly you didn't think you were going in to get a prognosis like that? Or was it, we're going to do more tests or we need to do something else? Is that the type of information you thought you were getting? Absolutely. Uh -huh. I thought it was a precursor because nope. Initially, my uh, stage two cancer, they'd taken a biopsy and they'd proved that it was, uh, it was cancer. Mm -hmm. I hadn't had a biopsy on anything, so I was expecting this was perhaps a precursor. And my wife, at least about 10 times previously to my meeting, had said, I'll come with you. And perhaps it was part of the protection element as well. Um, but no, I decided to go on my own and it is one of the most stupid things I've ever done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I take it... Um when words like that are being spoken, it, it, it must almost seem surreal or out-of-body experience. It, it is, um, and it's a common theme which perhaps comes through in the book as well. When you're told you have a life-changing, life-limiting medical condition, you go into shock. Mm -hmm. And you know the oncologist is speaking to you. You can see his lips moving. You know there are sounds coming out, but your brain is trying to catch up with what you've just been told. And you come away from that meeting um, incredibly numb. You're trying to process. And then later on, you, the questions that you perhaps wanted to ask and should have asked then come back to you. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's, it's, an immense, um, it's an immense experience, which I, I, I really hope other people don't have to go through. But yeah. unfortunately... As you mentioned, um, with over 3 million people in the UK living with cancer, there's a lot of us that, that go through this. Yeah. When I was reading your personal story within the book, <clears throat> there was a, a bit that really jumped off the page at me, and I actually clipped it here. So um, 
The large pale waiting room was filled with other people whose lives had been touched, more accurately hammered with cancer. They sat patiently with a worried expression, which I would soon come to adopt. And along with other patients, friends and siblings, they waited to see the oncologist. Now, that almost kind of stopped me in my tracks because yeah. I've been in one of those waiting rooms with a family member. And I actually remember um, taking a second and looking about. You have people flicking through magazines, kidding on that are reading them. You have people doing an in chat about anything that all that traffic or the pothole was murder in, in the way in. Um, people sitting by themselves staring at their shoes. Um, there can't be many rooms like that in the world where people are sitting patiently, politely in a waiting room to be potentially told devastating news. I, I can remember thinking, this is surreal. It it is. It's um it, it has to be experienced to be believed. Mm -hmm. The emotions that you go through and having now been in that room a number of times and having been on the end of uh, phone calls um, as well mm -hmm. uh, from oncologists, you, you soon assess, yes, there are people waiting to hear, you know, either what do I have or what's the latest um, scan results? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be positive? Is it going to be negative? And usually um, you're there with someone else mm -hmm. um, to pass the, the time whilst you're waiting. But as soon as the oncologist comes out and and calls your name, then yes, the uh, y your emotions go into overdrive. So what what did that first week look like after being told you had stage four? So stage four does that basically means it's it can't be it can't be cured. It's treatable, but can't be cured. Uh, for the majority of cancers, yes. Um, and when I was growing up, perhaps similar to you, you know, in the eighties and part of the nineties, if you were told someone had stage four cancer, that was that. Uh, that mm -hmm. was it. You know, you know, when's the funeral? Mm -hmm. Potentially would be <laughs> would be the the next question. So yeah, it's 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 certainly livable. I now know a lot of people who are living with stage four cancer, um, and depending on your oncologist, the difference perhaps between incurable and terminal will depend on the type of cancer and if there are any options for you as well. But yes, it's the best way I described it is that as soon as you're told, you know, the wrecking ball of cancer starts swinging through your life. Mm -hmm. uh, it touches everyone, doesn't it? It does, It yes. touches everyone. Uh, did you ask about, um, when I was in, it was with my father-in-law and he didn't want to know about outcomes and times and he wasn't interested. Um, did you want to know about statistics and facts and what your future looked like? I did. Once I composed myself and got over the initial shock and trying to uh, process what I'd been told, um, I, I did ask. I wanted to know, based on the treatment that I was going to start, what the statistics were. You know, I, I come from the world of IT. There's, we're surrounded by data, statistics, measurement. Everything's measured in our world. So I wanted to know what the statistics were. And the oncologist showed me a chart which had a, a very interesting graph um, which started off the timeline. Everyone's up here and then it drops very sharply wow. over the period of one to two years. And then after three years, starts to level level out. And I'm I'm on day one, looking at that chart, and I asked them what the probabilities were of me getting to three years. That was a target in my mind that I set myself, and it was about thirty three percent chance wow. um, that I would be alive within three years' time if the treatment was successful. They're not great odds. They weren't. Yeah, yeah. Betting on your football team. You know, three to one, you might think I'll have a punt yeah. when it comes to, am I going to be alive? Um, and the, the unfortunate thing for uh, for stage four melanoma is the majority of people um, where treatment has not been successful um, have a lifespan potential of about nine to 12 months. Nine to 12 months. So um, we're all blissfully aware that we are dying. We are matching towards that. But when someone puts a a time scale on that. Yeah. Um, how how is it possible to explain how you how that impacts you in terms of being able to um, think about your own mortality with a date? Yeah, it's it's a very good question. Um, we all know, you know, we have a length of string. We don't know how long that length of string is as far as our mortality. But once someone presents that you may have a very short piece of string. Um, 
the the hardest thing is obviously telling your family and mm. telling your kids. Yeah, um, that's the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Sit them down and uh, explain. And my kids, they were late teens, um, so they're they're adults. So we we shared everything with them. Um, what the treatment was, what the potential outcomes would be. And it brings everything into, into sharp focus. I mean, just simple things like, I've been, been meaning to put a will in place for about mm -hmm. 10 years. Suddenly. I better do that. <laughs> better do that. Yeah. So we got that in place. And we just started to look at, you know, what the priorities were over that period of time. We knew it was a two-year course of treatment. And I should be relatively well. The treatment that I was prescribed is immunotherapy, which is a game changer in the world of cancer. Uh, and you, I was basically going into my local um, hospital, which thankfully was just a 10 minute walk. I was getting an IV um, injection of drugs and I was walking out and I felt fine. So no, none of the chemo, radiation, therapy, sickness and... No, absolutely not. Immunotherapy is completely different. And I did feel a sense of guilt um, when you're in the treatment room. Again, it's not the sort of place you go into unless you have to, but you can see people who are obviously on chemotherapy and not faring well with it. And I'm sitting there reading a book, listening to music, having a cup of tea, and then walking out again. And you feel quite guilty about, about that. But... Yeah, they put things in sharp focus for us. So as a family, <clears throat> we considered the fact that I may have nine or 12 months if the treatment didn't work. So in two th the start of 2020, we made a whole lot of plans. We were going to travel. We were going to spend a lot of time with friends and family. We would have regular get-togethers. And so 2020 was all about spending time with people wanted to spend time with. Then there was a wrinkle. There was a larger wrecking ball, is perhaps <laughs> how I'd describe it, that came swinging through everybody's life. Yeah, which is COVID. It was COVID. And lockdowns. It's probably more lockdowns than COVID. Uh, there was a lot of lockdowns. And because, um, like every other cancer patient, we had no idea what would happen to us if we caught COVID, I was put on the shielding list. Um, one of the main benefits was we got a slot from ASDA quite quickly mm -hmm. for, uh, for uh, grocery every, deliveries. Every cloud. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, that, uh -huh. that's one of the benefits yeah. of, of being on uh, on cancer treatment. Mm. Yeah, we, we had to shield, um, couldn't leave the house. Um, thankfully, we could, the weather wasn't that bad that time of year. So yeah, like the first people, lockdown was good. First lockdown was good, was good. My son came back from university, moved back in with us after being away for a couple of years. And we spent time together, but if we had to use Zoom. And I must admit, not knowing whether the treatment was working and not being able to leave the house effectively for a few months, that had um, quite an impact on my mental health. Yeah, I could, I could only imagine. Was it the, what did it create? Was it a depression, an anxiety, and all of the above? Um, pr frustration and huge sense of fear of missing out mm -hmm. uh, for myself and for my family. There were things that I wanted to do. Um, simple things like, you know, go and see my mum. She lived an hour away. I couldn't sit with her, give her a hug, have a chat. Everything was over Zoom on telephone. And I just kept looking at the clock thinking it's ticking away and there's nothing I can do. No. Looking back now, obviously there's a, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Uh, and clearly with COVID, we were all dealing with something that we knew nothing about at the time. Are you resentful of the lockdowns? Do you think they were necessary looking back? Um, they were absolutely necessary because it wasn't just about me and, and my family. We all know people that were vulnerable. But I've, I don't know about you. I know some people that, that died mm -hmm. um, during COVID who were vulnerable. Um, so I absolutely believe that um, it was necessary to protect society. Um, and politics aside, um, certainly living in Scotland, we had very clear guidelines mm -hmm. and knew what we should and shouldn't do. And so, for, you know, for the greater good of everyone else, yes, it was um, to everyone's benefit, I think, um, that we went, that we had to, sh to lock down to keep other people safe. But yes, there was definitely this frustration. I'd be staring out the window thinking, I can't even go walking up that hill because we're all being told to to stay, in or stay, stay indoors. indoors. Um, so you mentioned within your story as well where your element of hope came from, and it was a chance conversation, a chance meeting? It certainly was. 
And it, it's incredibly hard telling your family and your friends, um, but obviously you and I had a, a working business relationship and I, I had similar relationships with a whole number of customers throughout the UK. Um, and I considered a lot of them to be friends and some are, are very good friends that I dealt with. And I wanted to go and see the customers and explain that I had to take a leave of absence. I decided that I was taking some time out from my work and I wanted to, to share with them why and what the plan would be for uh, for someone else picking up mm -hmm. whilst I was gone. So I visited a number of customers, uh, one of which you know very well, in Bells Hill. And I sat down with the uh, with the directors and I told them why um, I had to take some time off. I shared my, uh, my cancer diagnosis and they were fantastic. But one of the directors, um, Kenny Godfrey, just said that his brother ran a company in Australia which did trials on the drug that I was about to receive for my cancer. Wow. And if I'd been standing, I would have collapsed to mm -hmm. the floor. And Kenny offered to put me in touch with his uh, brother, Alistair, to, uh, to share some information. And yeah, that evening, I got an email introducing me to Alistair, and we conversed over email. He asked me a lot of questions. I re replied and told him everything that the oncologist had told me. Mm -hmm. And the next day I had, and I'm getting quite emotional about this, I had an email from Alistair, which suddenly the light in the room just exploded. He shared information and some data and his experience of the, the drug that I was on. He knew a heck of a lot about melanoma cancer. And reading that email, suddenly I had... I had hope, wow. which I hadn't had until that point, and I shared mm -hmm. it with my family and with my friends. And just, it, it's strange the decision I took to actually go and see customers and share this. I suddenly found someone who's a, a world expert in yeah. immunotherapy. It's funny how the universe shows up sometimes with that, isn't it? It, it's, it, uh -huh. it does. Karma, fate, whatever you want uh -huh. to call it. Yeah. I'm a Blind great luck. believer yeah. in, yeah, mm -hmm. good things do happen. Mm -hmm. um, and... I guess he was sharing these statistics of the trials in terms of what they were seeing, the results they were seeing, the longevity they were seeing. So was it the opposite from the graph of doom that your oncologist had taken you through? Or was, um, that, was that a better version <laughs> of the graph of doom? I, I think yeah. they still work from, from the same data, um, but Alistair obviously was perhaps a bit more at the coalface um, in gathering data as well. And with the trials, he's obviously involved in in uh, um, patient testimonials. So, and the thing about this uh, type of treatment uh, for people with melanoma, advanced melanoma, mm -hmm. stage three or four, you go back ten years, there was no treatment, wow. and you had to get your affairs in order because mm -hmm. there was no treatment. And the immunotherapy treatment was actually specifically designed for melanoma cancer because it didn't respond to chemotherapy. Or radiotherapy. So I, I suddenly had found a, a world expert um, in my type of cancer, and he just he just shared everything that he could. And it, it, I don't think we can underestimate how important hope is in that change of mindset. Because when I spoke to you, um, when you did that meeting with ourselves, yeah, um, it felt like a goodbye rather than a um, rather than I'm I'll, I'll wait for some treatment. I can remember when you left. Yeah. I thought bloody hell. Yes. Um, that was an overall positive. <laughs> um, but after that, you must have, it, was that, do you see that as a catalyst for a change in mindset and actually trying to get out in front of your own life? Um, again, very good point. Um, I've not read any papers. I've not studied into the effect on a life-changing mm -hmm. uh, medical condition on having a positive mental attitude. But that conversation, those emails certainly flicked a switch on in me was, yes, I can take this on. I can beat it with the help of the amazing NHS in Scotland with friends and family. And I tried to do things to, to instill a positive mindset, um, not just for myself, but within my family as well. And that, that was the catalyst perhaps to, uh, to pursuing um, that track. So the important question, how are you now? Because what are you, three years? 
from, I, from that fateful day? Yes, I'm yeah. now coming up to uh, to four years since my diagnosis okay. in December 2019. So you're smashing the graph. Uh, I'm, I'm smashing the graph. Yeah. I've, I've, I'm on that uh, that level track. And remember chatting to my oncologist and saying, okay, so f- after three years, w- when people die, um, is it due to the cancer? I say, we've got no idea. No. <laughs> <We've got laughs> people no die idea. for all sorts of so reasons, yeah, don't like, they? Yeah. Strangely, not, yeah. Yeah. strangely, I took <clears throat> solace for, from that fact. But um, yeah, for the last 18 months, both my tumours um, can no longer be seen. They have shrunk to, you know, there may be a trace of it. Um, the cancer is still part of me. It's in my DNA. So th- this is a bit I don't understand. Um, so there's no tumours. So where is the cancer? Um, the cancer got into my bloodstream, which is why the tumours uh, spread. Right. So I will always be stage four melanoma cancer. Um, it can come back. We know cancers can come back. And thankfully, I'm, uh, I'm scanned every six months just to check and make sure. But certainly post-COVID and I had um, quite serious side effects from the treatment as well. Ended up in hospital for a month and then I was bedridden for about five months during the second COVID lockdown. Wow. Um, but since then, um, life is is just exploded for us, uh, for my wife, family and uh, and friends. And we have, we've now got a new balance in our life, which we didn't have pre-cancer. Yeah, because you were hard, hard at it. You I were was. always chasing that number, like like <laughs> like, like a lot of us. So yeah. I, I take it it's realigned your priorities. Um, and you're back working. Out. You should say, yes. yeah, uh-huh. yeah, mm-hmm. I, I am. Yeah. Um, we're, we're each, I was working five days a week. I was mm-hmm. traveling in the country, um, going to you know many events and and you know seeing customers. Uh, I now work two days a week. My wife had a gift shop in the town that we live in, and we decided to sell that which we did. So she now has more free time. And yes, we're off um, We're off enjoying life. And so this is a nice balance just now between working, traveling, uh, enjoying ourselves and uh, working on the book. So in terms of some of the, the elements of cancer that people often don't discuss openly. So you mentioned, and, and it's mentioned throughout the book, yeah. um, skin anxiety. Yes. Um, so explain what skin anxiety is. It's, it, it sounds fairly obvious, but... It, it is. So when you're being treated for cancer, um, you have regular scans. These could be CT, CT scans, could be PET scans or MRI scans. And you get a letter through the door telling you your scan is on this date. And then you get another letter telling you you're going to speak to your oncologist. It could be two, three, four weeks later. So you go for the scan, and at that point, the radiologists can see what's going on, Mm -hmm. and they have to do a report, which is sent to the oncologist. So in that intervening period of two or three weeks, every twinge that you feel, every slight ache, your mind plays tricks on you, Mm -hmm. and you think the cancer is growing or it's spreading. And you go through high anxiety based on your scan, therefore scan anxiety, Mm -hmm. until you meet with your oncologist and they tell you what the results of the scan were. Now, obviously, during COVID, there was a, a lot of pressure on the NHS, so sometimes it would take a bit longer for these scans to come through. Sometimes the oncologist would be able to see the scan, but didn't have the radiologist's report. So the couple of nights, certainly for me, before meeting my oncologist, there's not a lot of sleep because your mind is constantly playing tricks on you. And anyone who's who's been through you know, cancer or, or any other life-changing uh, medical event, that intervening period between your scan and your results, it's, it's a horrible time. And does it get easier? Obviously, you're doing it every six months now, you're four years in, or is it always hellish? It does get easier with time. Um, obviously, again, depending on your personal circumstances, but... You know, I moved, I was being scanned every three months and then the oncologist was very pleased with the way I'd responded to the drugs. And I was supposed to be on the drugs for uh, two years, but after eight months, I was taken off them because I had a severe reaction, mm-hmm. um, ulcerative colitis, which strangely is something I've had for about 28 years. But immunotherapy, one of the side effects can be your your body starts att- attack- attacking It goes you after know. everything. It yeah. Does, uh-huh. yes. yeah. <laughs> it, it, go, it goes after everything. Um, plus, um, uh, the tumours had started to shrink mm. in that period as well. So, yeah. So, and then 
because I was stable for a, a longer period, you then move to six months. So yeah, for me, it, it anxiety does ease over time, but every time you're still thinking, what's going to be the results this time? What's going to be the results? And the other thing um, that you mentioned the other day was about cancer ghosting, which I was amazed about. Mm, yeah. Um, basically, we are probably out of fear. People don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. So they simply avoid you. Yes, mm. there there are many people, um, certainly that I spoke to within the within the book, that have experienced cancer ghosting, and it's it's perhaps part of your the human traits that when you're faced with with you know a friend or a family member who's going through a trauma you know what do you say and you don't know what to say because you might not have experienced that before and there's a fear of saying the wrong thing and i've heard so many stories from people where friends or, or family members have perhaps inadvertently said the wrong thing um so that it, it it's a fear and the the term cancer ghosting comes from the fact that you know there are people that will rush towards you perhaps to help you out and sometimes it's people you don't expect and then there are people that perhaps you are quite close to that you just don't hear from mm -hmm. so what advice would you give to someone to deal with someone who has cancer I'm, I'm not talking about a, 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 a wife or a husband or, yeah. a, or, or, yeah. or a, a brother or sister but a friend because um, a lot of the time people they don't want to ask questions or they're worried if they do ask questions, it will seem too much. They also, there's also the fear of, well, the person has cancer, but they're not cancer. So yeah. um, they don't want to talk about it all the time. So what advice would you give someone who is thinking it might be easier just to hide from that individual? Apart from giving them a copy of the book, which uh, is, is you yeah, know, uh, absolutely. Sh sh uh, showing something and giving someone to someone. Um, just try Reach out in, in some respect. You might knock on the door, you might give them a phone call, might send them a WhatsApp message or or a text if you're our age. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but just try and perhaps have a normal conversation. You know, if if your friend's into football or golf, you know, did you see the game? Did you, did you watch this? Try and have a normal conversation. And if they're confident, they might share a bit more about the cancer. And I'm, I'm very conscious that... I'm quite happy to talk about my journey and talk about my cancer, but not everyone's happy to listen about it yeah. uh, for whatever reason. But the main advice I'd give is just reach out with something. You know, some people will come around with, you know, here's, here's a lasagna I made. And before, before you know it, you're chatting about potentially, you know, what's going on in their lives or other things. Not being constantly in the cancer bubble is really important for your mental health mm -hmm. as well. You don't want every conversation you have just to be about cancer. Yeah. There's always a few people in your life who have the ability to just come in and speak absolute nonsense to you and take your mind <laughs> off of most things, don't they? Uh, <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So surround yeah. yourself with those people. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you uh, know who they are. Uh -huh. Yeah, And you want to be treated normally. So again, in the, in the realms of giving people advice, for anxiety, mm -hmm. is there any advice that you could give someone who's in the early stages of that, or yeah. unfortunately, is it just a a, a horrible part of the, um, the disease? It's a horrible part, but certainly, you know, I know we'll come on to a bit more about the book. But for me, finding my cancer family was was life changing through a number of charities and online forums and and regular online meetings because it was during. COVID, um, finding people who had a similar lived life experience were perhaps going through the same treatment or had been through the same treatment. I have some amazing friends I would never have met if it wasn't for cancer. And we get it. We know how it feels. We know what's going on in our brain. So the advice I give, especially for anyone that's newly diagnosed with cancer, you know, that wrecking ball is going to swing its way through your life and your family's life. There are some amazing organizations and charities out there where you can connect with other people. Um, one of the charities that, uh, that I'm a great fan of, um, we've been supporting with copies of the books, is Maggie's mm -hmm. Cancer um, Centres. Started in Scotland about, you know, 25, 27 years ago. They have 24 centres throughout the UK. And you just walk in 
There's no need to be referred. There's no need to make an appointment. You walk through that door and you get the Maggie's hug. You're offered a cup of tea and a biscuit and someone has a chat with you and just wants to know why you've walked through that door. Go in with your, your husband, your wife, your kids. Everyone's welcome in there. And you then start to to experience um, the support of the cancer community. And you'll meet other people as well that perhaps have a similar lived experience. So the main advice I'll, I'll get is don't try and do it on your own. Try and find um, other organizations and people that know what it feels like. I think that's incredible advice because it's amazing through my own experience with it. I didn't know any of them existed. I, I didn't know like the family could have went down and spoke to someone. Yeah. We were very much, okay, it's happened to us, so we'll deal with it as us. Um, but it, it, it sounds like perhaps that's not the best idea. And I guess the last bit of advice, if you if you make yourself going to that meeting by yourself, mm -hmm. so first thing is don't do it by yourself. That, that, that. That, that's the first one. <laughs> it is. Um, what would you want to tell yourself? If you could tell yourself anything going into that, to, to that room, what, what would you share? Before I walked in, um, there is hope. Mm -hmm. There's always hope. Uh, it might not seem like that. When you hear the word cancer, something in your brain kicks in and you start visualizing all sorts of out outcomes. But certainly with the advances in medicine and we're very privileged to have the NHS. I love the NHS. They saved my life and yeah. the people that dedicate their life. Doesn't care how much money you have in your bank or no. Absolutely uh -huh. not. It's, it's universal. And at the start of the book, um, I actually explain what the NHS is. For anyone reading this, there's a few copies internationally. Um, the NHS are, are very, very good at looking after you um, physically. And with the advances in medicine, um, there is hope there. And also in finding um, your cancer community, perhaps, or other people, you'll hear stories of hope. You, you will hear about um, stories of people that aren't with us anymore, because that's, that's the unfortunate, sad reality. But more people are living with cancer um, than previously. And I think everyone's hope is our kids look back and think people died of cancer. How, how ridiculous does that sound? No. Ab absolutely. Yeah. We can go back in time and, you know, people died of TB. People yeah. died Affection. of... Affection. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. yeah. There's so many things that, you know, medicine has, has caught up and perhaps um, without getting into it too much, you know, perhaps, you know, we have a responsibility in our lives to try and, and ensure that, you know, we do whatever we can to ward some of these uh, illnesses off. Oh, absolutely. And in the west coast of Scotland, we are not the best at that. Um, there's a lot of risk factors. Yeah. In terms of you, you weren't a sun worshipper. You weren't out using a, the, the Tannerif down the, 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 the local <laughs> main street, were you? The, absolutely not. Um, pale skin, freckles, red hair, typical Celt. Mm -hmm. um, I, re I remember from a very early age, my mum would apply the uh, the sun the suntan lotion, which uh, felt like uh, cream straight out of the dairy, this <laughs> thick gloopy substance all over me and cover me up. And she used to actually get the um, the factor fifteen sun cream. That was that was the highest factor back in the seventies. Oh. She'd get it on prescription for me. Prescription, prescription. Yeah. She'd get on prescription from the doctor. Um, and because we didn't go abroad on, hol on holidays, mm -hmm. you know, in the seventies and eighties, and so yeah, I'd, and I've pretty much avoided the sun most of my life. But with a complexion, I'm more susceptible to things like melanoma. So you think it's just one of those things? It is, and you can try and dwell on the what if scenarios, but the reality is, I have it, yeah, and I have to deal with it. And I, I have to look, I have to look forward. But certainly, advice for anybody, you know, the sun and um, other ways of uh, of tanning, apart from fake tan. Fake tans, you know. Fake it, don't I, bake I believe, it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I believe quite good for you. You know, you know, more people are being diagnosed with melanoma than previously, so be careful uh, with those UV rays. Especially young people who it's, are, yeah. Especially young people, yes. We've, we've chatted to our kids, nieces, nephews, etc. Be very careful. Um, in life, there's no such thing as a, as a quick result. No, uh, or free. No, or free. Um, so, did you ever think you were going to write a book? 
Not at all. No. Not at all. Um, so where did the idea come from? Where, where did the seed start? Yeah, the, the seed started um, when I found my melanoma family. Um, they listened to my story and I listened to their story. Everyone's story had an element of hope. And I thought, wouldn't it be great, especially for those people that, that are newly diagnosed and their family and their friends, to try and pull together um, stories where people had been affected by cancer um, and they talked about their hope, what their hope meant to them at the time or what hope means to them at the time and, and stories. If, we all have individual stories, don't we? We're, we're all unique. We've experienced things that um, perhaps other people want to listen to or can relate to. So it was just through um, that community, I thought it'd be a good idea to try and pull together some stories to initially help people affected by cancer so that they don't feel alone. It's an incredibly scary place to be with a cancer diagnosis. No, absolutely. So um, you had the idea, then you stalked people on social media, you spoke <laughs> to all your support yes. groups, you started pulling these um, together. But how do you go from having a collection of stories to having something tangible published sitting in front of us here um, today? Having some fantastic friends and family and finding a sponsor. Um, so the book is self-published. We don't have a publisher at this point in time, but we're, we're looking into that. Um, the stories were you know, collected and given from people I knew and people that I didn't know. And one of the per people that, that I met who I knew through the world of business was Ricky Nickel, who set up Comms World, um, a communications company all throughout the UK, but initially set up in Edinburgh. And I sat down with Ricky at his kitchen table, explained what the project was, and we had a chat. I just switched the phone on and we had a chat about his experience with cancer and hope. And he asked me, you know, how I was going to get the book published. I said, well, I've got some friends that could potentially help, uh, but I'm looking to try and raise some money to get it actually printed and bound and, and then, you know, sent out. And so about 24 hours later, Ricky called me and said, um, Kev, how much do you need? And I, I had a sort of figure in mind, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps I should have asked for more. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I told Ricky and within 24 hours again, he'd call back and said, Comms World are going to sponsor the book. They'll cover all costs. Wow. And we ended up printing 1,500 copies of the book, uh, the vast majority of which were given out to cancer charities and treatment centers, which again, I stalked on social media mm -hmm. and got in touch and said, we're doing this. Would you like some free copies? And there's some interesting questions coming back. You know, free? <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> you free? Know, <laughs> free? Do you have to pay for, you know, delivery? Mm -hmm. No, no. Absolutely free. And so um, a very good friend of mine, Derek Watson, who's an amazing um, graphic designer, um, he helped me to pull the book together. I could not have done this without him. And he knew the printers. And my son, my sister, and a friend edited the stories, all 39 of them. My nieces and nephew and a friend of my son, who all have English and journalism degrees, they did the proofreading. And my daughter, who's studying illustration, she designed the cover of the book, and she did an illustration of Anna Wheeler, whom the book is dedicated to. And it took about a year and a half from initial idea to actually physically getting her hands on the book in May this year. You seem to be very fortunate with a team of crack experts around you who can pull together a book. Uh, it, 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 it is, and willing to do it free of charge yeah, as well. It's also very important. Um, so what's been the impact of the book? Um, it's amazing. As I said, the vast majority have gone out to, uh, to cancer centres. All 24 Maggie's cancer centres have copies of the book. Um, there are other charities and treatment centres. And I've had unsolicited feedback from people just saying how much the book meant to them and their family, that they didn't feel alone, that they take hope from other people's stories. And very quickly, after distributing in, them in May, we realized there was demand for more. And so again, uh, through sponsorship, through my business community, um, we have printed another 5,000 copies, which are going out to 68 cancer charities and treatment centers throughout the UK and the Republic of Ireland. And the, um, the, the demand is growing because you mentioned there's 3 million people living with cancer in the UK. Um, there's estimated to be over 350,000 people a year diagnosed with cancer in the UK. And 6,500 copies of a book sounds like a lot, but we're scratching the surface. Really. Yeah. 
So for this book, um, what's the next phase? What are you hoping to achieve with it? Um, the next phase is we're going to be launching this as an ebook, so people can actually buy it. So up until now, I've been sending out copies on request, and I've just been asking people, make a donation to a cancer charity of your choice. Here's an individual copy. Obviously, the 5,000 copies will get handed out to people that are affected by cancer. But long term, we're hoping to launch the ebook um, later on this year. Is that on Kindle type it, of thing? It will be on all platforms. Right, yeah. uh-huh. It will be available for sale, obviously not just within the UK. And we're working with a charity to make sure that all of the profits will go to that charity. The only thing that's in it for me and my friends and family is helping people. Yeah, that, that, that's amazing. Um, and is there, do you have another book in you, do you think? Um, it's interesting. I, I get asked that quite often. I have other ideas for books. Um, I've just started talking to uh, a, an independent Scottish publisher. We're kicking around some ideas. Um, but any books that come down the line will follow the same format. It's about helping people. About helping people. If anyone's listening to this today and wants to help, what what can they do to help the book, to help get the message out? Um, out of the 5,000 that we uh, that are now printed and sitting in a warehouse in Glasgow, uh, ready to go out, we have about 300 left. So if anybody knows of any cancer charities or treatment centres in the UK or Republic of Ireland, Get in touch. I have boxes of 18 still available to be sent out. Um, and if uh, if anyone wants to um, potentially share their story in the future, um, by all means, get in touch. I have no idea what book two yeah, or three. We've got all the, yes. <laughs> the, the contact points scrolling in the background here if anyone we, wants to get in touch. We have. Uh-huh. Um, yes, so um, please, please get, get in touch. Um, and when you look at the book, um, a lot of people have mentioned that, that it's hardback. You know, perhaps it'd be cheaper to to print, you know, paper copies. But the idea of the book is if you've read it and you then know someone that's affected by cancer, hand it on. Mm -hmm. Pass it on. Pass on the hope. And that's why we went for a hardback to make them more durable. Yeah, that can get passed from hand to hand to hand. It can. Publishers might not like that, Mm -hmm. but um, (laughs) that's that's the aim of the book. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what's next for you personally? Um, We... We've had an, an amazing year, year and a half, um, myself, my wife, Sophie, and kids um, enjoying life. Mm-hmm. We had an amazing trip to Canada. Uh, we promised ourselves that once we came out of the other end of the cancer treatment, we'd go on a, an amazing holiday. So we spent a month over in British Columbia wow. visiting friends and family, mm-hmm. and we did everything. Mm-hmm. We did the Whistler tour. We went whale watching. We went on a grizzly bear safari, which was wow. uh, <laughs> uh, quite exciting. And uh, we were there with just just our little phone cameras. And you can see the grizzlies on the other side of the river. Or there was one that just wandered into the road that we were uh, in the minibus going up and down. And I got chatting to this guy who had a telephoto lens about that size. Mm-hmm. And I said, if I give you my email address, can you send me some of your photos? So we've got these amazing pictures of grizzly bears just standing I take it they're river. bigger than they seem in real life they are huge especially in September because they're just constantly scooping the, the salmon out of the river right so they're well fed themselves. Yeah, well uh-huh. fed not that interested in us thankfully mm-hmm. as yeah because they're eating uh-huh. <laughs> they're, they're yes eating. I know so yeah with, that was a big holiday this year and I've already told Sophie that the big holiday next year is going to be ger- in Germany in June where myself and five other million Scots will probably be heading over yeah. to watch the uh, watch the Euros. And in between time, it's it's spending time with people that we want to spend time with. Excellent. Um, well, a heartfelt thank you for coming in. It's been a real, you, you probably hear this all the time, but it's an inspirational yeah. story. Oh, thank you. Um, it takes a lot of bravery to sit here and to talk so openly. Um, I know it can't be easy at times, so heartfelt thank you. But... Um, I'm sure the message that we've spoke about today will help someone somewhere, so thank you. It will do. Thank you very much, Danny. You made this very easy.